So our next speaker, <coughs> excuse me, is Anne Chambers, uh, who's a biographer, novelist and screenplay writer. Her books include T.K. Whitaker, Portrait of a Patriot, Eleanor Countess of Desmond, Ranji Maharaja of Connemara, At Arm's Length, The Rich Crowds in the Republic of Ireland, Lord Mayo of Tibbet and Long Burr, 1567 to 1629. That's the next one I'm going to read. Now, I, I, I finished, as I said, I finished reading with Grace O'Malley when we had a little talk about Tibbet and Long at lunchtime, and, and I'm definitely going to read that book. And I've already read the, um, um, How Peter Brown's Second Mark Was a Slave, but that was a brilliant book. And uh, Granny Wells, Sea Queen of Ireland uh, for Children. She's a pas- passionate about making the past accessible, as well as adjusting history's glaring gender imbalance. So I'd like you to welcome Anne Chambers. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me too. I have to admit that I feel a bit of an imposter here today, insofar as I cannot claim a drop of O'Malley blood in my DNA. I'm sorry to say. But I do take some consolation from the fact, however, that some years ago I was officially adopted into the O'Malley clan, uh, who have indeed encouraged my research and writing into the clan's past history over many years. Now, since the first edition of my biography on your famous ancestor, Grace O'Malley, indeed it was launched in this very house by one of her modern day descendants, the late Jeremy Lord Altamont. Such is the sheer magnetism of this remarkable woman that the book really has made its own niche in Irish publishing history, never having been out of print since first published 40 years ago. I want to assure you I was a child writer, but I'm sure that will go by the bow. So over the years, Grace has also taken me around the world, indeed from Westport to the West Indies and many places in between, to talk about her amazing life. Now, over the years also, I have literally been inundated with requests from people from around the world, all claiming descent from the Pirate Queen. So consequently, this innovative project being undertaken by the O'Malley Clan Association into Grace O'Malley's genetic antecedents and family connections through DNA testing is both timely, I think, and worthwhile. Now, over the years, my own research for the biographies of Grace and her son, Tibbent Along, first Viscount Mayo, and most recently for her eighth, an eighth great-grandson in descent, How Peter Brown, second Marcus of Sligo from here in Westport House. All this research has unearthed many family connections, both of Grace's O'Malley can- antecedents and indeed her direct descendants. Now, I found that names of past generations of O'Malley's are listed not only in the ancient annals of Ireland, but also in the English state papers and other other manuscript collections of, of various periods. And invariably, they all relate to some reference to their maritime heritage. For example, one of the earliest records I found was in 1123, when, and I quote, a Thuhal Emelia, Lord of Oul was drowned with his ship at Arran. In 1415, the annals record how another Thuhal, returning home to Oul with Scottish mercenaries, a mainstay of the O'Malley's maritime empire, with seven ships and their crews, a storm arose on the western sea which drove them towards Scotland, where six of the ships with all their crews were sunk. Thuhal, with much difficulty, effected a landing in Scotland. While another entry testifies how a known O'Malley went with the crews of three ships into Killy Beggs up in Donegal, and I quote, where they raid and burn the town and take many prisoners. This is the other side of your heritage, you know, very exciting. Pirates of the Caribbean type here. In 1585, the Annals record the death off the Iron Islands of a Thuhal O'Malley, whom the Annals describe, and I quote, as the best pilot of a fleet of longships in his time. Now, following the seizure of part of their territory, Ul Iachtharacht, that is the Barney of Barashul to us, by the Anglo-Normans in the 12th century, there are numerous examples of intermarriage between the O'Malley ruling family and members of the de Borgo or Burke conquerors. 
For example, the famous Edmund Alban of de Burgo, who died in 1375, married Sive, the daughter of Jermyn O'Malley. In 1432, a Raymond de Burgo married a Joan O'Malley, while in 1440, a Tyg O'Malley married Sabina de Burgo. The famous de Borgo O'Malley chalice, now residing in the National Museum of Ireland, was made in 1494 to celebrate the marriage of Thomas de Borgo with another Grania O'Malley. Now, the English state papers, as I find, found, also contain references to various members of the ruling sept of the O'Malley's. They record that in 1546, for example, how Spanish, French, and English ships had to pay the O'Malley chieftain, Grand Newell's father, Dudara, for permission to fish the sea under his control. I would hope that the Irish government might take a lesson out of that, because somebody told me yesterday, I was down on the beach and he'd been out on a boat, that he saw five Spanish trawlers literally dredging the seas off Clare Island yesterday. So, you know, maybe the uh, Dudara O'Malley had it right. Let them pay for it. In 1576, the English Lord Deputy, Sir Henry Sidney, writes of meeting the O'Malley chieftain in Galway, whom he describes, and as I quote, an original Irishman, strong in galleys and mariners. While in the summer of 1593, in her own answers to the 18 articles of interrogatory put to her by Lord Burley, Queen Elizabeth's Secretary of State, with whom indeed she developed a very special connection, Grace O'Malley herself confirms, and I quote, that the castle, town, and lands of Murisky, which is Murisk, is possessed by Owen Mac Thomas O'Malley, now chieftain by the name of O'Malley. This name O'Malley comes up quite often. And when this DNA thing continues, the Malias also have to be taken into consideration. As, as you said, uh, Morris, there are many versions of the name O'Malley uh, in the state papers. As he said, I think I counted around 29 in all. But do you know, the word Malia to me is the one that is the original O'Malley name. O'Malley is an anglicized form of the name. So anybody with the name Malia, I often think, is one of the original uh, the bearers of the original name. And indeed, I would like to refer to Grace O'Malley where this is concerned. You know, the old legend that Grace Grania Whale, that she somehow was bald. No, no, it wasn't. It was Grania Melia. You know, but the English had a Grania Whale. And then somebody in folklore or for fiction reasons said, well, Mwale in Irish means bald, so consequently this woman had to have shaved her head or some such thing like that. In her personal O'Malley family tree, I found that Grace, while she had at least four half-brothers, would seem to have been the only child of her parents. Owen Dudara O'Malley, chieftain of Clan Malia, and her mother, Margaret O'Malley, who was the daughter of Connor Og, Mac Connor, Mac Muil Shotland, of the sept of the O'Malleys from Moher. Now that, as you know, Moher Lake in the southeast part of the barony of Murrisk. I state this because Grace is mentioned in the records, in other records, as being, and I quote, the sole heir to her mother, Margaret. Consequently, Grace O'Malley was endowed with O'Malley blood on both sides, which most likely indeed contributed to her later remarkable seafaring career. Indeed, I often say to people, you know, if Grace O'Malley had been male, She'd have been just another O'Malley doing what came naturally for thousands of years. But the fact that she was female and took to the sea, even today the sea is a great barrier to us so-called liberated women. If you asked a classroom of young girls, what do you want to be? I doubt if one hand would go up to say, I want to be a mariner, I want to be a fisherman, I want to own my own ship. So you can imagine what that barrier was like in the 16th century and combine that with all the superstition relating to women on board ship. They're referred to as the devil's ballast, the harbingers of squalls and storms at sea. And she absolutely overcame all these obstacles, as I say, both of man and nature in her career. Now, research among the Elizabethan state papers reveals some other family connections. One of the most famous, uh, famous episodes in her checkered career, as you undoubtedly know, was her meeting with Queen Elizabeth I in Greenwich Palace in 
September 1593. Now, contrary to legend, Grace did not sail willy-nilly up the Thames, bang on the door of the palace and demand admittance. As I found, her visit to the English court took many months of preparation and negotiation. And may I say it now, if any of you wanted to go to see Queen Elizabeth I today, what would you have to do? I mean, you wouldn't go banging, uh, taking the Aer, Aer Lingus flight over to the, arrive up in Buckingham Palace or Windsor and bang on the door and say, I want to see herself. The same thing applied in the 16th century. Grace O'Malley had to prepare. She had to know who was who in the English court. She was being pushed into a corner here by Bingham. She had nobody in Ireland. Uh, all her friends in the English administration, including Sir Henry Sidney, were long gone. She had nobody, but she had the... The wherewithal to think through the Machiavellian web of getting to the Elizabethan court. And she picked on somebody. And it would be the most unlikely person one would imagine if you didn't know or find out about the background. When the de Borgos came here with the Norman invasion and took part of the O'Malley ancestral lands, Ulithra of the Barney of Burrishu, with them came a family called Butlers, who over the succeeding centuries became the great Earls of Ormond down in the beautiful, beautiful medieval house down there in Carrigan Shore and elsewhere, Kilkenny Castle, all of these, they were powerful. During the time of Queen Elizabeth I, there was a blood relationship between the Bolin family and the butlers of, our, of our, the Irish butlers. And the skin of the house at the time was the handsome daredevil, Black Tom, Earl of Ormond. And when the lands here were beginning to be taken from the Gaelic clans like the O'Malley's here around Clue Bay, in, for fear that anybody else would get in, the butlers resurrected the old claim that they had through the Norman invasion to lands on which Grace O'Malley's own castle, or her husband's castle, should I say, Rockfleet stood. So Grace O'Malley was aware that this black tom was firstly related to Queen Elizabeth through her Boleyn. Uh, mother. Anybody related to uh, uh, Anne Boleyn got a warm welcome in the Elizabethan court. Secondly, he was a handsome good looker, which helped where Elizabeth was concerned. It was down to Carrigan Shore that Grace O'Malley went. And when I found the letter of introduction written by Black Tom, the Earl of Ormond, you could see that she went to Elizabeth. She was protected because all her bad deeds had been written to the court by various English administrators here in Connacht particularly, from John Perrett down to Richard Bingham, from the Sydneys, from Malby, who indeed uh, burned uh, the, the O'Malley Castle here at Cahar uh, Namarth. She knew all of that. She was so clued in, this woman. In a way, I always think that she, like most maritime people, look, the sea to them was a highway where to us landlubbers it would look on as a barrier. Not only was she uh, accessible to new markets and new people, but she also, the sea was a great bringer in of gossip and news. And that, even though she lived in a remote area here, the O'Malley's were perhaps more clued in what was happening in Europe and certainly in England than most other uh, clans or tribes here in Ireland at the time. So I'm just mentioning that in terms of the way that she actually got to the English court. Now, the correspondence between Grace and the English court prior to her two visits, she went twice to England. First one, she met the Queen. The second was Lord Burley. The second one took place in spring 1593. It also revealed some information about her O'Malley relations. For example, in her first petition to Queen Elizabeth, dated May 1593, Grace mentions a brother, Donal O'Malley, known as Donal Napieva, then living in the O'Malley fortress here at Cahar Namarth. Now, from the evidence, Donald would appear to have been a half-brother to Grace, the son of a woman other than Grace's mother. In 1593, this Donald had been captured and imprisoned by the English governor, Richard Bingham, on a charge of killing some English soldiers. Following Grace's intervention, Elizabeth ordered Bingham to release, and I quote the Queen's own words in her own letter, Donald O. Piper, she calls him as the Queen referred to him, and restore him to his castle and lands. Now, this Napieba is a very, very interesting. Was he maybe very good at the Ilan pipes? Was he a great piper? Napieba. Possibly far more it is to do with casks of wine, the pipes of wine. 
Donal possibly was an importer of wine from either Galway or directly from Spain in here to, as we have it here today, the lovely harbour at Carnamarth. So you see, there's always something behind every name, and there's uh, possibly, you know, a, a, fact, a more factual reason for the nickname than that he was a musician. Donald's fortress, indeed, of Carnamarth was attacked and almost destroyed in 1589 by the then English governor, Nicholas Malby. Now, it's very interesting to note that the Carnamarth fortress of the O'Malley's, they always built their fortresses always around by the sea, as you know. Um, that survey by O'Donovan in 1862 describes this Carnamarth castle, or the ruins of it, as having stood about four perches southwest of Lord Sligo's house at Westport. Now, in my calculations, 21 yards from where we're standing today in a southwesterly direction. This, as Catherine will explain later on, I'm sure, the sea actually came right up here in the days. This lake uh, to the front of Westport House is a new addition to the diversion of the, of the river here. So the sea came up quite close. So this ancient uh, fortress, O'Malley Fortress of Carnamarth, was 21 yards southwest of where we're sitting today. Now, my research for the biography of Grace's youngest son, Tibbet Nalong, revealed further information about members of the ruling O'Malley family. In 1576, for example, a Lachlan O'Malley was confirmed as seneschal of the barony of Murris by Queen Elizabeth I. In 1585, Lachlan, Owen and Tyg O'Malley were signatories of the famous composition or infamous composition of Connacht. In 1597, an Edmund O'Malley, a son of the chieftain, was listed as one of the 13 hostages handed over to the English governor, Connors Clifford, as a pledge of loyalty from the clan. In 1617, perhaps the same Edmund O'Malley is listed as being chieftain at an inquisition and grant of lands. Now, among the manuscripts that survived the 1922 attack in the Four Courts, I came upon a bill of chancery dated 1604, and indeed still bearing uh, the burn marks from that attack. It testified how Tibbet Nalong had executed a claim to the lands inherited by his mother Grace from her own mother Margaret. In 1604, these lands were being claimed by right of Breton law by a Hugh O'Malley, who, not having a male heir, had divided the lands between his cousin Tyg O'Malley and Tibbet Nalong. The document further revealed that Grace's mother, Margaret O'Malley, herself had inherited these same lands, and I quote, as sister and sole heir of their former owner, Dudara MacConnor Og, MacConnor O'Malley. So I hope these names will be of interest down the road. All these O'Malley individuals living on the clan lands in the 16th and 17th centuries, I hope will prove of interest now for the DNA investigations. And also, I think we should add, the present-day O'Malley's and Malias still living on the ancestral lands here. We forget, you know, it's not all the O'Malley's who went away who are important. It's the O'Malley's who stayed are equally important. And I'm sure that the DNA will reach all people. And the present-day O'Malley's relationship to Grace O'Malley also uh, uh, looked at. Now I'd like to just speak uh, uh, briefly about the direct descendants of Grace O'Malley through her two marriages, which of course are more likely to have O'Flaherty and Burke bloodlines. Grace had three children by her first husband, Donal and Coggy O'Flaherty, chieftain of the Ballina Hinch sept of the great O'Flaherty clan of Connemara. Her eldest son, Owen O'Flaherty, was killed while in the custody of a Captain John Bingham, a brother of the Governor Richard Bingham, in 1586, having been inflicted, as Grace herself informed Queen Elizabeth, with 12 deadly wounds, which she says she counted on her son's body. Owen was married to a daughter of the chieftain of Castle Bar, Edmund Burke, and had a number of children. Grace's second son was Murak Namuir O'Flaherty, who succeeded his father as chieftain of the barony of Ballina Hinch in Connemara. A shrewd, powerful chieftain, he played both sides in the traumatic years leading up to the Battle of Kinsale. But when he sided with Grace's arch enemy, Sir Richard Bingham, it brought the full force of his mother's chastisement down on his head, 
when in 1591, as is recorded in the state papers, and I quote, Grana ni malia manned out her navy of galleys and landed at Ballinahinch, where her son dwelleth, burned his town and spoiled his people of their cattle and goods, and murdered three or four of his men who resisted. Some chastisement, some mother. In Mirko Flaherty's will, dated the 13th of April, 1626, it is apparent that he had six sons, all Grace O'Malley's grandsons, and two daughters, her two granddaughters, Circa and Una. The O'Flaherty family were later dispossessed, and these are Grace O'Malley's grandsons and great-grandsons, during the Cromwellian confiscations, and many of her descendants, O'Flaherty descendants, either emigrated mainly to Europe or fell down the social ladder to become mere tenants of their former ancestral lands. Grace O'Malley's only daughter, Margaret O'Flaherty, named after her own mother, married Richard Burke, known in the English state papers as the Devil's Hook, chieftain of Curran and Ackle, and a steadfast ally of his famous mother-in-law. In 1588, he was involved in the ambush and killing of John Brown, ancestor of the Browns of Westport House, how things all go around in a circle. He was the first sheriff of Mayo, and he also created the famous first ever drawn map of County Mayo. Grace's youngest son by her second marriage to Richard in Iron Burke, who in 1581 became the MacWilliam of Mayo, the highest tribal position in the county, with his wife's help, may I add, was Theobald of Tippett Nalong. In 1983, here in Westport House, among the amazing collection of manuscripts which are now in the National Library of Ireland, I found much original material about the life of this enterprising son of the Pirate Queen. He was born at sea, he inherited his mother's seafaring ability. He was taken as a hostage by Bingham and he was brought up in the household of John Bingham, Sheriff of Sligo. Tippett married Maeve O'Connor Sligo, a sister of the local chieftain Donnock O'Connor Sligo. They had four sons, second by Miles, who became the second by Con Mayo, David, Theobald, Richard, and three daughters, Mary, Honora, and Margaret. Initially, Tibbet rebelled with his mother against Bingham's harsh rule and was captured and imprisoned in Athlone Castle on a charge of treason, which of course meant death. It was to secure her son's freedom that Grace undertook her epic voyage to intercede directly with Queen Elizabeth in 1593. As the old, outmoded and divided world of Gaelic Ireland finally crumbled towards the end of the 16th century, Tibbet made a deal with the English securing the lands of the MacWilliam ship once held by his father, as well as the lands of his foster father, Miles McEvely, in the barony of Cara, to make him the largest landowner in County Mayo with an estate of over 60,000 acres, and that was at a time when every other chieftain were losing their land to the carpetbaggers and invaders who came in after the defeat of Kinsale. Tibbet studies ground. And you know, while we make heroes of O'Neill's and O'Donnell's who fled, Tippett and along Grace O'Malley's son stood up to the new ways and tried to help himself, his family, and his dependents, clansmen, to try and overcome this massive change that had occurred in the years after Kinsale. Total, total upheaval as the Tudor conquest finished and England, Ireland became basically a province of, of, of England. And this also explains why in the early years of the 17th century, Tibbet moved away from Berishul and from Clue Bay into Kinturk Castle and indeed Castle Burke, because that was the lands of his foster father, which he bought. And I found all the documents relating to that buyout here in Westport House. They'd been kept here for over 400 years. And it was very, very interesting to see Tibbet Nalong buying the lands of his foster father, Miles McEvely, and offering him his protection against the incoming surge of English uh, carpetbaggers and, um, I suppose, planters at the time. And that is also why Tibbet Nalong and much of his descendants, many of his descendants, are buried in the Viscount Mayo tomb in, Bar Bar in Ballantover Abbey. Tibbet's grandson, and I also must mention that there, of course, is a chalice there, uh, that his wife, Maeve O'Connor Sligo, had made after Tibbet's death. Now, that chalice, beautiful uh, chalice, 
was made for Muriscabi to connect him again back to his Omali ancestors, but it is now for anybody to view in Ballantubber Abbey today. Tibbet's grandson, Theobald, the third Viscount Mayo, that would be Grace O'Malley's grandson, was ex or sorry, uh, great grandson, was executed by the Cromwellians in Galway in 1663, not for any apparent crime, but simply to get their hands on his large estate, which they did. His daughter Maud Burke married John Brown of Westport. Their portraits hanging outside in the entrance hall are, I think, the oldest surviving in the house today. On the death of John Burke, the eighth Viscount Mayo, direct descendants, in, 16, in 1767, without a male heir, the title was claimed firstly by a David Burke, a Catholic tenant farmer from Ascalon near Lewisburg, as next male heir in descent from Richard, Grace O'Malley's grandson and the fourth son of Tibbet Nalong. Despite the sworn depositions from family members of the eighth Viscount, including his sister, and by the Chief Herald of Ireland, all of which I found in a forgotten file in the genealogical office, because of David Burke's perceived unsuitability by the government of the day by virtue of the paucity of his means as well as his religion, the title was deemed extinct by the authorities. It was later conferred, illegally in my opinion, in 1780, on a John Burke, a Baron of Nace, who in 1785 was further elevated to the Earldom of Mayo, which is still in vogue today. Indeed, the present holder uh, lives over in uh, near Clifton. As I further discovered, some direct descendants of Grace O'Malley's grandson, Richard Burke, and rightful heir to the Viscount title, were still living in Lavalero near Ballyhonis, and others in Ahagar here near Westport, well into the 19th century. Perhaps through the auspices now of the genetic tracing uh, by, initiated by the O'Malley clan, a modern-day claimant to the vacant Viscount Mayo title might yet, may yet emerge. And to that extent, I have to say that my biography of uh, Tibbet Nalung uh, is, being re, uh, is being launched in paperback this autumn under a new title called uh, Lord Mayo, Son of the Pirate Queen. So a lot of that research will be uh, contained in, is contained in that. Now, there are other interesting connections that emerge, particularly while researching Tibbet Nalong and indeed Grace O'Malley's biographies. Their bloodlines include Grace O'Malley's great 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 granddaughters, Maria and Elizabeth Gunning, dubbed by King George III as the Gorgeous Gunnings, from Castle Cruz County, Roscommon. In the 18th century, they took English society by storm with their beauty. One married the Earl of Coventry, and secondly, the Duke of Hamilton, and the second married the Duke of Argyll. So, O'Malley blood runs through the veins of many prominent uh, British aristocratic families. I also have to talk just briefly about another biography of Grace O'Malley's uh, son, and that was here from Westport House, How Peter the Second Marquess of Sligo. An extraordinary life left behind him 15,000 letters, which I had to go through and find throughout the world, but a lot of them were, well, some of them were here in Westport House. His, his uh, handwriting being atrocious, no more than my own, it certainly didn't help and took eight years to research and write and travel in his footsteps. He was one of the most travelled men of his age, and that's saying something. He was a bosom buddy of Byron, so I can tell you the first part of his life were, were, were launching a new ed or the paperback edition, and it's not going to be called The Great Leviathan, it's going to be called From Rake to Radical, because he was your typical rake uh, to start with. But what a transformation after he's married to the Earl of Cl uh, Clan Rickard's daughter, by whom, may I add, he had 14 children, being an only son himself. It's some, it's some, uh, he got into all sorts of trouble, even imprisonment, a uh, celebrity, we call it today, trial in the Old Bailey in 1812, thrown into prison. Imagine the only son from here. His grandfather was the famous iconic um, Admiral uh, Rich, Sir Richard Howe, who goes down in the annals of uh, English maritime history after saving England from an invasion from the French, among other things. And he turned around into this great liberal landlord, both here in Ireland. Now, he did tend to be, in his early life, a bit of an absentee. And his father even quoted Polonius's advice to his son from Shakespeare's Hamlet to try and get him to see the error of his ways and set, sit down and start looking after his estates here and also in the West Indies. 
<clears throat> he was, as his family was before, great proponents and supporters of Catholic emancipation. The Browns were a Catholic family before, like so many other aristocratic families, had to change their religion to hold on to what they had. I'm sure faced with the same thing, we'd all have maybe done the same thing. Daniel O'Connell spoke of him as a landlord, and as you know, Daniel wasn't given to praising Irish landlords. Mind you, he was a landlord himself, we forget that as well. But um, he said that if all the landlords in Ireland were like Lord Sligo, Ireland would not have turned into the laser house, which means a poor house it did prior to the famine. His liberal ways, which he took from here, he was all into multi-denominational. Imagine being into multi-denominational education in the 1820s here in Westport. And he was stopped both by the Roman Catholic Archbishop and the Protestant Archbishop. Do things ever change when you see the same thing up in Northern Ireland today? It's amazing. He tried to have multi-denominational um, education here, that religion shouldn't matter, he said, in education. He transferred his liberal ways, and he was a very, very good um, entrepreneur here. You know, the British always, when Irish trade ever impinged on British trade, with the old wool trade first, when it was uh, um, hitting the British trade of the Cotswolds, that was absolutely... Uh, put out of, out of business, when the Irish linen trade, indeed, which the Browns supported and established here in Westport as a means of employing people, um, when that was, uh, uh, as well, almost priced out of the market in Britain, he turned to try and make corduroy here in Westport and set up a corduroy factory to try and keep people, uh, um, keep people employed. As you know, the... The Industrial Revolution never came to Ireland with a small, maybe Belfast a little bit, maybe a little Dublin. It never came here. Britain never allowed the Industrial Revolution to come here. So the tenants that were thrown off the estates after the Napoleonic Wars in England had a place to go. These were the labourers and tenants who were pushed off when they changed over from horticulture to pasturage. But they had the great cities of Lancashire and all the industrial cities of the Midlands to go and indeed live albeit living in appalling conditions. He transferred his liberal attitude across to the West Indies. And, you know, I heard somebody here giving an, an interview to somebody and talking about the slave owners that were here in Westport House. It was an absolute ignorant, ill-informed lie. This man was quite extraordinary. He inherited the two estates that they inherited in the West Indies from their Kelly grandmother. You know, the Kellys were long established in Jamaica, long before the Browns got there. You saw, if you go out there, you'll see the famous uh, um, Elizabeth Kelly there, and she brought these two estates. One was a, a sugar plantation, the other was a farm, a pen, as they refer to them in Jamaica. And when I went to go to Jamaica, or when I went to Jamaica to research for the biography, I was absolutely gobsmacked to see how this man, 200 years later, was held as champion of the slaves. Because he went, when he went as governor general in 1834, so appalled was he by what he saw that he took the side of the slaves. And he was ejected from his office by vested interests, uh, both commercial and political, in England at the time who had him recalled. But that's when he made his biggest impact because he joined the anti-slavery movement. And in 1834, stood up in the British House of Lords. They were then discussing the big debate on emancipation of the slaves in Jamaica. And there were people, for commercial reasons, of course, once slavery went sugar, the bottom really fell out of the massive sugar market, which was the new gold in the 17th and 18th centuries in England. And he stood up in the House of Lords and he said he was making this public announcement that on the 1st of August, 1838, he was going to free every single person, he referred to them, who worked on his estates in Jamaica, thus leaving the British government with no alternative because you couldn't have free slaves on one plantation and not have it on the 900 others. We should have a statue to how Peter Brown up here in Westport. But you know, I think we have inherited some kind of a, I don't know what it is, to our old aristocracy here. And we should be big enough now to get over that. They weren't all bad, they weren't all good, they were like the whole lot of us, you know, the good, bad, and the medium in all of them. But he is a very, very special person, and I'm sure you will be talking a little bit more about him as well today. Now, also in descent from the Pirate Queen was the late award-winning film producer John Braeburn, married to the daughter of Lord Louis Mountbatten. 
with the tragic perversity that so often inflicts Irish history. Their son, Nicholas, a 14th great-grandson in descent from Grania Whale, was killed together with his grandfather, grandmother and young friend when their fishing boat was blown apart in 1979 by a terrorist bomb off Mullockmore Harbour. Indeed, in waters once traversed by, his, by the young boy's famous 16th century ancestor. But back to the O'Malley clan. From the old Irish poems to the English state papers, almost every reference to O'Malley's through past centuries refer to and celebrate them as intrepid seafarers. To us landlubbers, the sea is invariably linked, looked on as a barrier to the O'Malley's. It was ever a highway to new markets, new countries, cultures and people. Consequently, as perhaps this, D, this your new DNA experiment will uncover, O'Malley blood may well run in the veins of people of other nationalities, especially Spain, Scotland and France. Recently I discovered an old poem translated from the Irish which celebrates the O'Malley Trans Association with the sea over the centuries, but it also names individual past members of the clan. And to end, which I'm sure you're glad I, I brought that in, uh, I would like to share with you now. And it's called, very appropriately, The Gathering of Clan Melia of Ool. We that were Irish before the gale, fighting the sea since the world was young, sing of our longing for Inish Fail under alien skies in an alien tongue. We wandered away to war and mart, but we found that Bamba was more than life, for never was woman the pulse of our heart like Bamba, the mother, mistress, and wife. Now out of the south, the north, and the west, when our bodies die, our one go sail in galley and longship to find our rest near the crumbling tomb of Grania Whale. Up the swinging surge past Clare Island light, silently in our spectre ships, and Bamba waits through the fragrant night to give us at last the touch of her lips. And twixt Blacksod Bay and the Lecky Rocks, Dunnock, who smote the howling Norse, cruises with Thera, golden locks, he won in the hold of the flying horse. To greet us coming and near them stand, Melia, our father, and Flan the fair, do Dara stabbed by the bloody hand, Tuchel of the battles, foundered of Clare. And the Tuchel that stuck on the Orcades in a blinding gale and left twelve score dead, with all his fleet twixt the pounding seas and the bloody anvil that is bore ahead. Murroch who broke the Dano gales and big tig row by the English slain, watch with Gráinne and John of the sails for our slim black longships rising from Spain. Till the rates of a thousand dark hulls span from Wheelon Beg to Moynish Moor, our own Clue Bay and the gathering clan is anchored there from shore to shore. From Criffin the King, whom the misty dawn found slain at Moylena in all his state, to Joseph Mock Owen and Seamus Bourne, who were hanged as rebels in 98. We that were Irish before the gale, fighting the sea since the world was young, sing up our longing for Inish Fail under alien skies in an alien tongue. Well, Taramari Kwe Potence.